Welcome to Madison Church. My name is Stephen Feith, and for those of you in the room, I am the lead pastor of Madison Church, and I'm glad that you're all here with us on this night. Um, we love to connect with you guys digitally, too. If you can't make it in person, you're not feeling well or anything. And if it is your first time with us, a special welcome to you. We're really passionate and excited about our mission of connecting people with God and each other. And when we see new people in our community, that makes us excited because it's like, hey, we're connecting with people and we're connecting them with God and each other. That's that's why we started our church. And so if you're looking for engaging content, a solid community, and meaningful ways to contribute to Madison, I think you're going to like it here. But before I go any further in our talk tonight, I want to make sure you're comfortable. I want to make sure everyone is comfortable. I'm just, look at me, you look, okay, you look pretty comfortable. It's not too hot in here for you. No, it's not too cold. If you're watching online, I can't do anything about the thermostat in your room. We have restrooms downstairs in the basement if you need them. Um, we usually have bottled water out there. I don't know if we do tonight if you're thirsty. Um, I can't do anything about the hard wooden pews, guys. That's just, it is what it is. I know, you know, that's just, it is. you could bring a pillow, I guess. If, you know, in a couple of weeks when you come back, you can bring a, a pillow to sit on. We try not to um, judge you for that. But the question is, and if you're watching online, are you comfortable? It's possible that I'm making you uncomfortable asking you if you're comfortable. It's ironic, isn't it? By me asking if you're comfortable, you're like, what's he getting after? Because if I say yes too hard, he might use me as an illustration here in about 10 minutes. And you're not wrong. Uh, you're not wrong, okay? We're talking about comfort tonight. And listen, comfort comfort isn't a bad thing in and of itself. Actually, comfort can be a very good thing. Air conditioning on a hot summer day is a comfort that I'm very thankful for. There's not a day goes by that I'm not thankful for the comfort that is indoor plumbing. Amen? Like, we love our indoor plumbing, right? Medicine for a headache or for an upset stomach, that's a comfort. That is a good thing. We can all get around that. And we try to make people feel comfortable here, too, at Madison Church. We don't ask new people to stand up and introduce themselves. I don't know if you've ever been a part of that experience. You're going to a new church, and you're checking it out, and they're like, we just want to have all the new people stand up, and then you got to tell your name, and where are you from, and then we, we clap for you, like, good job, you made it here. We won't do that for you. We're trying to create a comfortable environment. We don't have the offering plate up here on my table or up here. We are not going to stop service in 10 minutes and make everyone come up and drop something in. Again, we want to make you feel comfortable. I know that that can be anxiety inducing when churches do those things. And so, you know, we're going to, we're, we're not going to do that because sometimes coming to church can be anxiety inducing already, right? New place, new people, what do these weirdos believe? I know those are the questions you're asking. That's okay. You can keep asking those questions. Comfort can be a very good thing, but comfort actually becomes a problem when it's the goal. Comfort becomes a problem when it's a goal and not a gift. Comfort as a gift is a good thing. It's a, as a gift, it's a good thing. But when comfort becomes the goal, it becomes a very problematic thing in our life. And there is actually science behind this. There's research that supports what I am saying tonight. A professor from University of California, Mark Schuen, uh, studies something that he has called, he has dubbed the cozy paradox. So we've got a professor from the University of California, the cozy paradox, and he says that we have come, become such creatures of comfort that we lose our minds over the slightest annoyance and inconvenience. Think about this. How many of you in the last couple of weeks we're sitting in your car at Target, waiting for that employee to come out with the stuff that you ordered. Or you go into a Starbucks cafe, you pre-ordered your drink, and you walk in, and there's nothing on the counter. And even if it's only two or three minutes, or God forbid, five, we get livid, don't we? Where's the manager? One-star review on Google. I will burn this place down. Look what comfort has done to us. Maybe that's just me, though. Maybe you're not like that. But before you think that I would never, ever, ever do that, Stephen, what is wrong with you? Think about how you react when the internet speeds are slow at your house. I mean, just for hours. You're like, what is Spectrum doing today. Sorry if you work at Spectrum. I know it's not your fault. But that, what happens? Man, we lose our mind. When the internet crashes for like an hour and I don't know why and all I get is that we know there's an outage at your area and we're working on it. Are you 
I need some urgency here. Okay, think about this. The car in front of you doesn't jump on the accelerator the minute the light turns green. Like, you saw it half a second before they did. What do you do? I mean, your hand's already on the horn. Like, whoa, what are you doing? What are you waiting for? Got places to go, people to see, stuff to do. Light's green. Are you blind? Again, might just be me. Have you ever done this? You're at the grocery store, and you're in the express checkout line, you got like three or four items, you know, you know, three or four items, and you count the person's items in front of you. You ever do that? Oh, a few of you are. Don't worry. You don't have to nod or admit you're guilty, but like all oh, the inhumanity, the injustice of this situation. There's 15 items here, and you've got 16. I don't care if one of them's a stick of gum. Follow the rules. Get back over there to your lane. This is what we do. Professor Schuin writes, despite all of our many comforts, we have been increasingly, we have become increasingly oversensitive to even subtle adversity and general uneasiness. And our subsequent inability to cope feels like a, feels like feeds a wide range of maladies, including poor work performance, overeating, insomnia, and relationship troubles. Let's just let that sink in for just one moment here. The science that is being done at the University of Cal, when they're researching people, what they have found is that too much comfort might be the reason your relationships are struggling. Not what you would think of off the top of your head, right? When we think about why do our relationships struggle, was it perhaps because you have too much comfort in your life? Are you not sleeping well at night? Perhaps you're too comfortable. Eating too much? Might be comfort. Doing poorly at work is comfort the goal of your life. Now, I don't think, and I certainly didn't ever consider that maybe the reason that I don't sleep well at night or maybe the reason that I uh, smash a bag of chips during a Packers game is because my life is too comfortable. But the science is saying that maybe the issue, the underlying issue for some of the problems in your life might not be this and it might not be that. It might not be these really big things, but rather it might be that there's just too much comfort in your life. When comfort is the goal, it is actually a serious problem. And the greatest danger to pursuing comfort, the greatest danger of it, isn't sleep uh, deprivation, it's not overeating. The greatest threat to pursuing comfort above all else is that it can kill our calling. It can kill our calling. When we put comfort above all else, comfort can kill our calling. Think about it like this. Jesus, as far as we know, did not say, come, take up your remote and binge watch some Netflix with me. Now, I've read the Bible a few times, and I have not found it. I'm not saying it didn't happen. But rather, what we do know, he said, he says, if any of you want to be my followers, you must give up your own way. You must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. So today we're going to conclude this little three-part series that we've been in called Love Where You Live. And it might be an odd sounding name to a series. I was just reading again this week another article of a, an award Madison won. We're one of the best cities to live in. Like we're one of the most livable cities to live in and, and they judge us based on all sorts of things. And so we have a bunch of people who are judged cities based on if you would love living there. Madison constantly wins. But despite that, I bet there's been a time at least once in the last six, eight months, perhaps when it was minus 30 outside, you asked yourself, why do I live here? It doesn't feel like love when you walk outside and it feels like the air punches you in the stomach. Like, what is going on? Why? So we got to talk about this. How can we love where we live? And that's the question I'm trying to answer throughout the last few weeks, but it's not just an answer that I hope to give you. I'm not trying to objectively explain to you why you should love living in the city of Madison. What I want to do is actually help you love where you live. Whether you're going to live in Madison for the next 10 weeks or the next 10 years, I actually want to help you love the place that you call home more. And if we're going to, the thing that we talked about in the first week, the very first thing is that we have to begin to stop. We have to begin 
to approach the city, the place that we live, as contributors, which is very counterintuitive because we go throughout our entire lives consuming, 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 right? When you wake up in the morning, the first thing we're going to do, we're going to go to the bathroom or pour some coffee. It's, it's about consumption, what I'm getting. We sit down, we watch the news, we put our shoes on, we go to work. It's about consuming. What am I going to eat for lunch? You're thinking ahead. What am I going to do tonight? What am I going to do this weekend? And it's consuming, consuming. And then when Madison wins those awards for best place to live, often it's judged on what you can consume here. Rich diversity, this or that. Great food selection, this or that. Young city, lots to do. Again, it's about what can you get out of the city of Madison by living here. And for us to begin to love Madison, we can't just come into the situation as consumers. What can I get out of Madison? Because eventually we'll consume everything Madison has to offer. We won't love the city and we'll move somewhere else. And as we talked about in that first week, go ahead. You can consume and consume and consume the rest of your life. And you will eventually keep moving and moving and moving and finding new friends and having the same problems over and over, just different places, different people. Because you're not addressing the problem, which is that we need to pursue things as contributors. What can we do here to make, give back, to make the most of our time while we're here in Madison? Last week, we talked about how the first thing and the most important thing we can do is to contribute to the community through relationships, by being a good friend. We talked about how there have been studies that just show that most people, at least three out of five before the pandemic, felt lonely or isolated. Tell me, you don't have to raise your hand, but in the last two years, have you felt lonely at all when you've had to stay at home? for a few weeks when the pandemic first began, or when you had to quarantine, or if you got COVID and you had to stay away from everyone, did you feel lonely? So is everyone else. And the difference is, maybe if you're here tonight, is that you have faith, you have a God, you have a church community around you that even if you feel lonely, you know that you have community support around you, even if you can't see it, even if we're not in your house, we won't show up uninvited, but even if we're not there, you know you have a church community. What about the rest of the city? Do they know that? Do they know they have a God who loves them? Do they know that they have people in their corner? And according to the stats, they don't. So if we're going to love where we live, we have to begin to see ourselves as contributors. And the best thing that we can contribute to the city of Madison is relationships and helping people relationally. Not just left and right, not just with other people, but their relationship with God. And today I want to talk to you about choosing calling over comfort. Why should we do any of this though? I hope that's what you're maybe asking in the back of your head. Nobody else is probably as cynical as I am, but you should be asking the question, why? Why shouldn't I consume? Why should I work at creating relationships with these other weirdos in Madison? You know, people are kind of weird, right? Why should I do that? Why should I put aside my comfort for calling? Great questions. And simply answered by Jesus, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Point out the obvious here. He doesn't say, as the Father gave me the option to come to you, and I chose to come to you, so I am giving you the option to go out into the world if you choose to, if you feel like it, if you want to, if you're a gifted extrovert, if you have a spiritual conviction. Actually, it's quite simple. He just says, as God sent me, I am sending you. And it's hard to get that twisted and what he means. I am sending you. You are on a mission. You're here in Madison, Wisconsin. You're here in Dane County, whether it's Oregon or Verona or the west side of Madison, east side. You are here in Madison today in 2022 because Jesus has sent you here. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And we have to think like that. We really have to think like that. Jesus sends us here to love the people that we are around. It's how we move the mission of God forward. And being sent and following Jesus is all about choosing to step out of our comfort and into our calling. It's all about stepping out. You know, there's a story in the Old Testament, um, maybe you're familiar with it, a woman named Esther. And Esther had a choice when it came to her faith. She could choose comfort or she could choose calling. And actually, it's in a very exaggerated way that most of us, it's a decision that we will never have to make in terms of our comfort or our calling. And so um, there's Esther, and she grows up. She's just a regular Israelite. They're, they're persecuted. They're under these very just horrible regimes after another. And, and Esther eventually becomes, as a Jewish person, she becomes the queen of the Persian Empire. 
Um, and then eventually what happens is this king at the time of the Persian Empire, he says, you know what, we are going to kill all of the Jews. Genocide. We're just going to gonna get rid of them all. Now, remember, Esther is a Jew. Now here's kind of a, a tricky thing about the story is that the king who is married to Esther doesn't know that Esther is a Jew. Like that's not, he doesn't know that. And so word gets out that the king is planning on just killing all of the Jewish people who, who live under the Persian Empire. And of course, if you're Jewish, what do you do? You're panicking. And so they start coming up to the, the temple or the palace, and they're weeping, and they're throwing themselves on the ground. They're trying to just show, it, like, hey, don't do this. Don't do this, please. Like, don't do this. And Esther hears this from the palace. She's inside. And so she sends a servant to talk to her uncle Mordecai and find out what the heck is going on outside of these walls. What's going on, Uncle Mordecai? And so the, the, her servant goes, talks to Mordecai. Mordecai explains the situation to the servant. The servant comes back and talks to Esther. And what the message that Uncle Mordecai sends with the servant is, Esther, you need to talk to the king, your husband, and convince him to change his mind. You need to convince him to not follow through on this terrible plan. Now, this was actually a really big ask. Now, you might not think it's a big ask, but it, it is. Because in Persia, you were not allowed to approach the king uninvited. Even if you were his wife, you needed permission. The penalty, if you didn't, death. So if the king doesn't ask Esther, hey, Esther, come in here. Hey, Esther, what do you think about my new policy here that we're just going to kill all the Jewish people? If he didn't ask those questions, if Esther just comes to him and says, hey, I don't think you should do this, he could just have her killed. And you might think, no way, would he do that? Yeah, he actually did. He had a wife killed already. That's got to be in the back of Esther's mind too. This isn't like something that's super unpredictable. This is something that has historically already happened. Now Esther's community, her friends, her family, they're facing genocide. And yet she's facing her own dilemma, which is if I talk to the king, I might be killed. They might all get killed anyway. If I go in there and he kills me, then we're all dead. And so Esther has this, kind of just this conflict. What's she going to do? Comfort? Just not say anything? She's on top. She's the queen. Money, riches, whatever she wants, she already has. Where does she go with calling? Well, she kind of sends a message back to old Uncle Mordecai and says, yeah, I'd rather not. Honestly, this is in the Bible. We go to Esther chapter 4. She sends a message back to him. It's like, you know, I, I don't think so. I th we'll figure something will happen. I mean, she's kind of like deferring any sort of responsibility. God will take care of it. The king will change. I don't know. I'm not going to do this. But Mordecai, he's a good uncle. Mordecai, he's a guy I think that I could relate to because Mordecai hears that and he says, no, <laughs> you're not getting off the hook that easy. And so if, you, if we're going to just read in Esther 4, 13 through 14, because it's so powerful what Mordecai sends back to Esther. He says, don't think for a moment that because you're in the palace that you will escape when all other Jews are killed. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place, but you and your relatives will die. Who knows if perhaps you were made the queen for such, for just such a time as this. I love that line. Mordecai puts in so much purpose and mission. Perhaps you're the queen. You're in Persia right now for this moment. Perhaps this is it. And if you don't act, if you don't live up to the calling, you're missing the point. You can play it safe and, and choose your own personal comfort, but chances are, if you do nothing, you'll miss the very reason that God had you be queen to begin with. So what's Esther do? Should she choose comfort anyway? Uncle Mordecai's old. He just doesn't understand. You don't know Uncle Mordecai. I mean, every Thanksgiving, it's this or that. Now he's telling me to risk my life. Where does she choose calling? Esther sends Mordecai a reply. She says, go and gather together all of the Jews and fast for me. Don't eat or drink for three days or night. My maids and I will do the same. And then, though it is against the law, I will go in and see the king. And if I must die, I must die. Now again, this is a situation that most of us, you and I, will not face a life or death situation this week, choosing calling over comfort. But in this story, Esther does. She is facing life or death based on a decision, do I choose calling or do I choose comfort? And Esther chooses to step out of comfort and into calling, even though it might cost her her life. 
But the way that this story ends is that Esther was in that place for such a purpose as this, because the king does change his mind and the entire nation of Israel is saved. See, Esther used her place of privilege and power to rescue those who didn't have privilege or power. And as followers of Jesus, and we never presume that you are, but if you're in the room tonight and you are a follower of Jesus, you and I are absolutely called to do the same, to pursue calling above our own comfort. But will we do that? Will we talk about it tonight and then walk away? Will we talk about it tonight and will we do something about it? Jesus says to his disciples, anyone who tends to come with me has to let me lead. You are not in the driver's seat. I am. Don't run from suffering. Embrace it. Follow me and I'll show you how. Self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way, to finding yourself, your true self. What kind of deal is it to get everything you want but lose yourself? What could you ever trade for your soul? You see, the cross isn't just a means in which Jesus saves us from our sin. It delivers us from our sin. The cross isn't just a symbol of spiritual freedom. It's a metaphor for how we are to follow him. When Jesus says, give up your own way, he means give up your own will. Your own desires. Now, we're not very good at saying no to ourselves when there are our own goals, right? We talked about that in New Year's resolutions, things we want to do, and, and, and then we come up short. How will we do when we're not the ones coming up with the goals? How will we do when Jesus comes up with the goals for us, the purpose for us, the calling for us? It's not your plan, it's his plan. Will you be able to say no to yourself and your plans and what you want to do in order to say yes to what Jesus wants? When he says, take up your cross, it means accept God's will. Accept God's will for your life, even if that means sacrifice. It means to deny yourself, to say no to yourself, and to say yes to Jesus. When Jesus says, take up your cross, he says, say no to yourself and say yes to me. Our calling is to follow Jesus, but not just for yourself. And this can be kind of dangerous for Christianity when we think about my personal salvation with Jesus, and Jesus died for me, and it's about my relationship with God. That's not all it is. When you look around the room, it's about other people's relationship with God, too. And we look at the people who aren't here. You look at the empty space in the pews, and we think, who isn't here tonight? It's also about their relationship with God. When we're talking about picking up the cross, it isn't just about me, it's about my church, and it's about my community, and it's about my city. Esther risked her life to save God's people. Jesus sacrificed his life to save you. And now you and I have entered into God's cosmic story. The year is 2022. The place is Madison, Wisconsin. It's you. And what will you choose? Comfort or calling? And this is going to be practically hard. This is probably one of the hardest series, honestly, partly one of the hardest series that we've ever taught at Madison Church because it is so hard to do the things that we are talking about in practice. We can nod our heads and say, yes, that's what my faith is about. But when it comes to putting these things into practice, we, it's hard. Author Shauna Pilgreen writes, All, a, a life of comfort is called a win for the enemy. A life of comfort is called a win for the enemy. Once we make Christ our Lord, Satan has lost one battle. His next battle is to keep us comfortable so that we fail our earthly mission. We are to live out our calling, not our comfort. A life of comfort can keep us from our purpose. Let me put it in my words tonight. It is completely possible for you to follow Jesus your whole life. It's completely possible to love God with all of your heart and to have the promise of eternity right in front of you in the afterlife and to fail your mission. It's completely possible to love Jesus and still fail in his mission, still fail in his purpose for your life here on earth. It is completely possible. And the thought makes me sick to my stomach to think that I could love God, to love people, and to still fail my mission. And don't think for a minute that this is just for really religious people or people who are super spiritual. Stephen, you're a pastor. Of course, you've got to think like this. Jesus doesn't say, when we go back to John 20, 21, he doesn't say, as the Father sending me, I am sending pastors. 
So don't worry, regular people, I've got professionals. He says, I'm sending you, every single one of us. The calling is for every single one of us to follow Jesus and to live out his mission in every single part of our lives. And I know we tend to think about that's the big thing. We tend to think about the people, our neighbor, who would never ever go to church. And we, we tend to think, okay, if I'm following Jesus and I'm really doing this comfort thing, I'm going to share my faith and they're going to come to church and they're going to find Jesus and follow Jesus and I'm going to baptize them and hallelujah. But maybe it's not that. Maybe following Jesus is a lot more mundane than that. Maybe following Jesus is just showing somebody who's really hard to like and get along with kindness. Maybe it's just being patient. Maybe it's being more understanding. Maybe following Jesus means this week you're going to be intentional about not talking. Or maybe this week means you're going to be intentional about sharing how you feel. Maybe it's going to be, I'm going to ask more questions. It's not always the big thing that we tend to celebrate and think about, but following Jesus in every moment of every day thing. But I want to challenge you today. No action steps. An idea. Don't get stuck and the comfort of inaction. Not doing anything is easy. I'll do it next week is easy. I'll do it next month is easy. I'll do it when, dot, dot, dot. That's comfort speaking. And when you choose comfort, you're denying your calling. Don't put it off any longer. No more maybes. No more next weeks. No more tomorrows. Today. Right now. Jesus' voice is the one who says, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Now, in the present. Not after you get a seminary degree. Not after you've gone to church for 10 years. Not after you've said the right prayers. Not after you've gone through the right classes. I'm sending you. And Jesus has sent us to love the place that we live because Jesus loves the place that we live. Will you step out of your comfort and into your calling and to reject the comfort of inaction?